And we're going to go ahead and move to our next question now. And that deals more with engaging students in the interactive portion. So thinking about online activities, the ones that you as educators find, what are the most effective in terms of engaging the students in those online interactions in Mandarin Chinese? So thinking about the exercises that you do with your students, what do you find that's most engaging in getting them to interact with you in that online environment? Pas Lao Shi, I'll start with you, please. Sure. Um, I think there's a saying in Chinese, right? Uh, you spend 10 years off the stage for just one minute on the stage, right? So I think as I think about sort of how do you design a learning experience to be successful, particularly one online, which has its own sort of unique challenges, and perhaps interaction is one of those that we think of the most often because we don't perceive it as like you can turn and talk to your neighbor, that there's sort of technical steps involved in getting you to be able to interact in those sort of peer conversations that keep everybody engaged. I think one of the things we get trained on as teachers really early is the more you can sort of have people turn and talk, even if it's really briefly to a peer, rather than you and one person and 28 other people sitting there doing nothing, because why would they listen? They, they wouldn't and they wouldn't, you wouldn't either. In the staff meetings, we check out too. Um, I think really importantly, it comes down to sort of how are you planning for them to have those interactions? And what it, came, what it came down to for me, really, as I started to design things, was giving them a reason to interact, right? Whatever the activity is, whatever the specific goal is, you know, whatever the sort of format is that you decide works best in terms of interaction, whether that's text chat on something like a Google Doc, whether it's going to breakout rooms briefly, having an interaction and coming back, whether it's using Google Chrome extensions, one that I learned about in the pandemic in, in some space, probably not dissimilar to this online workshop that we're doing was Moat, which is a Google Chrome extension that you can talk on Google Docs. Um, whatever the, the sort of format is, um, I think what's most important is you give them a reason to, to actually be interacting. And that reason comes kind of in a couple of levels for me. Best case scenario, the reason is we're talking about something that I actually want to talk about. So I ask you to go find out whether Jin Lao is going back to China this summer, and I actually care to know the answer to that question. Great. You're going to put us in a breakout room, and we're going to actually talk about that. Um, often, though, because we are given content that we have to teach, or not all students are engaged on the same level, you know, we we do things like we teach daily routines. And you know what 14 year olds never talk about when they brush their teeth in the morning. But sometimes we say, you know, go ask your partner what time they brush their teeth in the morning. Nobody cares. The person doesn't actually care about the answer to that question. So if you can get a topic you actually care about, awesome. But if not, I think one of the other things we can do to give people a reason to listen is give them accountability after the interaction. You can't possibly go to... 10, 15 breakout rooms, especially if the interaction is going to be short, right? If you're sending them to a breakout room for 60 seconds, they're going to exchange a little bit of information and they're going to come back. You can't possibly make it to, you're maybe going to listen to one room between, you know, sort of the speed of Zoom kind of moving you there and moving you back. So what I, I gave that up, I honestly, I told my students I was always coming to the breakout rooms and I assumed that they would always assume that I would be in a different one and who knows when I was going to pop up. But I didn't. I stopped going because what I started doing instead was giving them something at the end of the interaction that they were going to have to prove that they did it. And what that can be as simple as you asking someone, what did your partner just tell you? What did you just find out? Right. Often it looked like having them because our students were one to one with devices. It had them recording something and it would be something along the lines of, you know, my partner said he does this, this, and this on the weekend. I told him I do this, this, and this on the weekend. So we have these two things out of three in common. It would be something that is a follow-up task that sort of ensures that accountability. So I think to come back to that sentence that Jin Al so kindly put into the chat, right? This idea of the, the devil is in the details. The prep happens for the teacher in the thinking beforehand rather than sort of what specific activity is it that works best because I think we're all under different technological constraints. You know, Terry has that really nice platform that I think she made herself, right? Not all of us have access to synchronous teaching, much less sort of all of the fancy technology that we can use if we're on an iPad versus a Chromebook versus a laptop. 
Um, so I think for me, it's really that accountability piece uh, that holds people a little bit responsible for doing whatever the interaction is in the classroom. The accountability piece is definitely key. I personally primarily work with the high school population. So sometimes you do need that sense of accountability. But I also like how when we can, we can't always do this, but I do like like you, I like to work in topics the students actually care about and they're interested in. It gives them some motivation to say, okay, I'm going to go find out this information and, and find something that I might be interested in. So thank you for that. Excellent. And I'll pass the same question to Jin Laoshi. And again, the question was, what activities have you found are most effective and engaging in teaching students in this online environment, trying to get them to speak and, and work with their Mandarin Chinese? Um, I really like what Gao Laoshi just mentioned. I think um, for 21st century teachers, uh, we really have to, to be creative, to be open-minded to find topics that um, matter to the students. So I, I'm not going to repeat, I think Gao just said it really, really well. And uh, I think there are other two folds after we identify interesting topics. Uh, number one is we need to find a platform or platforms to capture students' interaction. Right, and also we need to find um, a way to. How do I say that? It's not well. Maybe it's also a platform. What What I was thinking was, um, my school district is using a, a, a LMS called Schoology, and Schoology has a function called Discussion Board. And when we started to use it, I think at that time. Either the school district didn't buy the function or Schoology didn't design that function. It could only capture uh, typing. But I think now you can do both speaking and typing. I think that's great. That's a great, great platform for students to interact. So after I post um, a qu discussion question to the class, uh, I usually just ask each student to share their thoughts. And definitely, uh, usually I give them, a, you know, a deep modeling a little bit to show them, you know, this is what I would like you to, to, to say or to think. And also after each person uh, shares his or her thoughts, I ask them to give feedback, to have another round, you know, just adding another round of interaction. Uh, so they need to give comments to, to classmates' posts. And well, sorry, three. So usually I, I want everyone, every student has someone to comment on you know, their posts, right? So I usually just tell this, this, my students, give comment to the student who put the post on top of you and below you. And the third one is free of choice. You can go to anywhere, you know, find your friend or you know, find the post that really interests you to you know, make a comment. And students are also encouraged to respond to the comment. So it can be really a you know, back and forth, back and forth um, you know, um, activity. Um, another thing I want to share is uh, during the pandemic here, I happened to learn an activity called uh, Five Whites. It's actually an activity originally um, developed by Toyota, the, uh, the, the car company. And they, I think they figured it out. If you really want to find the root cause of a problem, you need to ask why five times. So it's like, why you are late to school? Oh, because I got up late. Why you got up late? Because I didn't go to sleep early. Why you, did, you know, like that. And I just thought it, it would be a perfect interpersonal activity. It's, I, I don't know if I should call that a platform. It's not really a platform, but you know, it's um, it's just a a way for students to you know interact. So, I think the beauty is we are not just teaching students to learn a language. I think at the same time we're actually teaching them some life skills. So maybe this problem solving skill. I'm hoping you know in the future. 
will help them, you know, in their career, you know, when they, I don't know, go to college. So I remember one uh, discussion I had with my level four was uh, why <laughs> some students turned in work late. So I want them to find out the root cause. It was amazing. They, you know, I got all different kinds of answers, you know, because we got too many homework assignments because, you know, uh, the internet at home was not reliable or all, all those different answers. So actually the five why um, strategy developed by Toyota, just stop here. You identify the root cause, that was it. But for me, I wanted my students to go one step further and I just pair them up after they identify the, the root cause. And sorry, I, I'm moving a little too fast. Let's go back. I put them actually not in breakout room because I just paired them up randomly. It's like, really, you might even don't know who your partner was when they did this activity. I really wanted to create this, you know, true interpersonal, spontaneous, unrehearsed, you know, scenario. So two partners, you know, uh, worked on a Google slide. They just type why and keep asking why until they identify the root cause. After that, I put them in one breakout room. I want them to talk and figure out the solution for that root cause. It cannot be just say, this is the problem. I want them to think about how can we solve the problem? And then they just also on this slide now, they can talk you know, uh, face to face on Zoom figure out the solution and type it out on the Google slide. So I think I really heard good feedback from my students. Um, so the, uh, the, uh, the prompt I give my level four is why they turn the homework late. And the prompt I gave my AP student that year was why even today we still see uh, uh, Asian hatred in the society. Oh my God. And they, I remember some um, root cause they identified uh, include um, some communities um, don't have too many interactions with people with different cultural backgrounds. So their solution was we need to invite, um, you know, diverse cultural, you know, uh, components or, you know, uh, people or presentations to those communities. It was really, I, I was really touched by, you know, the kids, um, by their uh, thoughts, by their uh, vision, by their uh, eagerness to solve, you know, real world problems. I'm hoping I explained it well. You did. And I, I really like the idea of not just doing one or two wise, but really pushing the five and I would think that that would probably really kind of push students a little bit out of their comfort zones, but I love that you got positive feedback from it. And remember, a lot of the growth that we have, especially when learning a new language, I can certainly vouch that the growth that I had, the exponential growth is doing things that I was very uncomfortable with. So I like the idea. I, I plan to implement that, the five whys into my classroom. Thank you for sharing that. That's fantastic. Thank you. And I'll pass that question again. It's the same question to Waltz Lao Shi. And the question is, again, dealing with interaction and what online activities have you found are most effective in engaging students in online interaction in your online Mandarin Chinese classroom? Mm -hmm. Well, um, in my classroom online, well, actually in my classroom face-to-face -face as well, we don't do pair work and we don't do group work, which is kind of unusual from a lot of people's perspective. Um, but we do talk to each other all the time, constantly, all the time. In fact, I have some students I kind of have to try to shut them up, which is gratifying, but not gratifying at the same time. Um, but the question is just what uh, Koslausha said that, or Gaulausha rather, why would the students want to listen? And that's been the flaw in textbooks since time immemorial that, you know, Juan va a la biblioteca, you know, John's going to the library. Who cares? Who's John? Where's the library? Why is he going? We don't care, you know. So we're going to try to personalize things. We want to try to make these things relatable to the kids. I've taught middle school. I've taught high school. I've taught college. I've taught adults. 
Um, so I right now I do mostly high school and up. I don't really take middle schoolers online because because reasons. But anyways, um, I love middle schoolers in person. But we try to find compelling topics. Now, obviously, like the video you just saw, I wouldn't say that I particularly care whether these people like Justin Bieber or not. I really don't care. But at least it was something relatable enough that they cared a little bit for that time. Okay. So the point is not talking about things that I care about. It doesn't matter what I like. I'm doing a job, right? It matters what they are interested in. So if I'm teaching middle school and they still like SpongeBob, if they're sixth graders, then by gosh, we're going to talk about SpongeBob. And I'm going to look like SpongeBob is the most exciting thing I've ever heard in my life. And I'm thinking, oh, but that's just the way it is. Because I want, I'm looking at the quality of interaction with my kids or with the students. With more adult kids, more adult kids, right? More adult people. Um, we can obviously go to a lot of topics that one would have to discuss carefully with kids. One example is I have uh, two groups right now that are at about around 150, 160 hours with me. So they have one class a week and they've been coming for a couple of years now, I guess. But it's about 150 hours. And so, um, and this was completely politically neutral, but the fact is that Donald Trump was recently indicted. And whether you like him or hate him, the fact was somebody that thing occurred. So I just said to my students, you know, hey, let's talk about this. What happened? I heard there was some news about Donald Trump. Can you tell me what it was, you know? And then we went together. I had started out um, on the resource I use, which is a comprehended cloud. It's not private. Anybody can use it. Um, I started out with some words like uh, indicted and whatever, good chance to teach bay, right? Bay, gow, and all this thing. Um, but I have enough blanks there that when they suggested a word that they needed, we could put it up and then use it. And because I'm still driving the bus, right, I can steer that conversation so that we get some immediate sort of almost artificially frequent use of that new word so that they help, it helps to get it into their heads more. But they're going to, at that level, they're going to remember what they need personally, and they're going to forget what they don't. And so I feel like my job as a Chinese teacher is to offer them the chance to get the vocabulary that they need. They've already had most of the structure. I mean, even in high school after Chinese too, there's not any more grammar to teach them. They've already done it all, at least with CI they have. So it's basically building vocabulary and, and getting things like that in there. The other thing with the accountability piece, um, I don't, really like after activities because anything where you're asking for information, we don't know how that information got between the students if they're somewhere else. Ex the worst example I've ever seen, this it's it's one of these funny, not funny things. I, I worked at a star talk where they wanted to use um, abacus with the kids. So they taught them how to use an abacus and then they set up this contest. They gave them sums and they had to work them out and you know pass it down and then the last one would write down. Well, they didn't do use the abacus to do the calculation. The kids were doing the math on paper, moving the beads to show the answer, and then <laughs> here it is. And you, I can't blame them for that because human beings use the easiest pathway to get what they need done, done. I have a good friend in Taipei. He's an interpreter. I'm an interpreter, okay? I do seminar for the Department of State, so supposedly I'm fluent in Chinese. Um, he's also trains interpreters over there. So he's fluent. We're both white. We're both native English speakers. So when we get together over there, we always say, let's speak Chinese this time. You know, if we're in Taiwan. Let's speak Chinese. And we start off and three minutes later, we're speaking English. We're two fully fluent people with the desire to speak Chinese together. And yet we can't. And that's sociolinguistics, which it's, it's a big topic, but it's, to me, it's not realistic to expect adolescents or even adults, really, to stick to a second language, even if they are very, very motivated, because they just don't have the tools yet. You know, their, their bucket of sophistication in Chinese is, is almost empty. Their bucket of sophistication in English is full, and it's very frustrating for them when they want to do something like that. 
So I tend to do uh, real-time accountability rather than doing an after activity. And that means working the crowd. Have you ever seen a, a politician or somebody at a meeting who's really, really good at social networking? They come into the room and they look around and they start going to everybody and they don't miss anybody. They speak to everyone, but they still, you know, they're still paying attention to others. Same with this. I'm going to say like to, um, I was in the tape, it was some kid, guy named Gonzalo, right? Oh, you, uh, you think Superman's cool. Um, I don't remember the names in the class there, but, you know, Betty, did Gonzalo say he thought Superman was cute? So this is keeping them accountable for listening to what's going on, even though I might be speaking directly to one student. They never know when I'm going to pop over to them. Or I'm going to compare them. I'm going to say, gosh, Gonzalo said Superman was cool, but Betsy said he was, you know, a big zero. So Betsy perks her ears up and somebody else does, and they know that. But at the same time, they know I will not ask them something that will embarrass them in class. So I can differentiate my questions that way as well. I might ask one of my struggling, more struggling students a very direct question on information. With the ones that are getting it better, I'm going to ask a more integrative question. So um, that's essentially it. I think that it's all about talking about things that they really care about. Not that I care about necessarily, um, but things that they care about. And that also means, folks, reading the novels and the, the magazines that your students read. At least look them over so you know what's going on in, you know, tween land or high school student land or whatever it is. I read Twilight. I admit it. I read it because at that time my students were all reading Twilight. I'm like, well, I better know what's in this thing. You know, it wasn't that bad. And I love how you made the point about differentiating that instruction to some extent and the students who are struggling, you're not going to call them out. You're going to keep them in an environment where they're still feeling comfortable. They're still going to build rapport with you and not feel like they're going to be dogpiled for making a mistake. And as an educator, I appreciate, I love hearing fellow educators having that similar philosophy. 